Hi, everybody. Pastor Dennis here coming to you from my garage. Uh, Marcia and I are sheltering in place, but I'm thrilled to be able to share uh, the God's Word with you this morning. Uh, we're going to be in Romans chapter 9, so let me invite you to open your Bibles there or the software package, whatever it is that you're using. Uh, as we dig into this text, it's important for you to know that these three, three chapters, uh, chapters 9 through 11, are all about the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. Because of that, there are a lot of Christian people that just want to skip over this section. Uh, many people see it as kind of a parenthesis in Paul's argument about the doctrine of justification by faith, and, and, and they just want to jump right ahead to chapter 12. Well, that approach really begs the question, why in the world would Paul devote three chapters to the Jews in the middle of this letter? Well, the answer is simply because God's dealing with the Jewish people throughout their long history has always, always, always clearly demonstrated the, the main point that Paul is making in chapters 1 through 8, and that's God's gift of salvation is given only to those who believe. So if you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're forgiven of all your sins, and you can say out loud with me, I'm saved, praise the Lord. It's the great gift of God given to those who believe. Well, that principle was established with Abraham, the father of the Jewish people. As he interacted with them, God promised that, that Abraham and Sarah would have a son of their own. And Abraham's response in Genesis 15, 6 is he believed in the Lord and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. So all Abraham had to do was, was believe in the Lord. God credited right standing to Abraham because of his faith. And the Lord spoke the same truth through his prophet Habakkuk. In chapter 2, verse 4, he says that the righteous person, the righteous man, will live by his faith. Those two verses, Genesis 15, 6, Habakkuk 2, 4, became the scriptural foundation upon which Paul built his entire theology of justification by faith. And he summed it up so well in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the, what, the gift of God not as a result of works, lest any man, woman, boy, girl, grandma, and grandpa should boast. So our salvation is simply a gift to those who believe. So are you trusting in the Lord Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection to bring you forgiveness of sins and eternal life? Then you are a true child of God, and nothing Nothing can separate you from that calling. And that's the context of, of Romans chapter 8 and what Paul has just finished writing. In chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, he, he confidently states, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor debt, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And since you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, his absolute assurance is that nothing, nothing can separate you from his love. Listen, this coronavirus and sheltering in place and quarantine, it's made a mess of, uh, of many, many lives. And we all feel like we're completely done with this and want to be over with it. It might have messed with your finances, messed with your mental health, messed with your, it messes with a whole bunch of things. But I tell you this, the one thing it can't mess with is your salvation. You can say out loud, I'm a true child of God if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're forgiven of all of our sins, and nothing can change that. Well, with that point stated here now, the main point of these three chapters, Paul, as soon as he wrote those words, realized a dark cloud was starting to form in his own soul about the Jewish people because he anticipated a negative reaction from it. Oh, wait a second, the Jewish people would say. Wait just a second. Uh, didn't God promise to always love us? And yet the Hebrew people didn't believe in Jesus, and so God turned to the Gentiles. Did God violate his commitment to the Jews? Did somehow he break his covenant with the Jews? And, and if God stopped loving the Jewish people, 
What gives Gentiles the thought that he would stop loving them? So Paul anticipated all of these questions. And as he does here, he really begins to answer the question, how does God's commitment of love apply to unbelieving Israel? Did their lack of faith somehow change God's commitment to them? Well, in verses 1 through 13 now, the apostle is going to explain four insights of how the doctrine of justification by faith alone applied to the nation of Israel that had rejected Jesus as their Messiah. It teaches you and me and us some really, really important lessons about salvation here that we need to know. Paul says, did it, did, did it change his commitment to Israel? He says, absolutely not. Notice first, the first lesson that we're going to get about salvation is that it's a gift that can be rejected. Let's dig into our text, chapter 9, verse 1. I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. First time I read that, I thought, what? Paul just finished saying that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ and his heart is filled with sorrow? Why is that? Verse 3, for I could wish that I myself was accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelite. Uh, Paul's heart broke for the Jews, his own race, because they refused to believe in Jesus. And his love for him was so strong, he wanted to swap places with them. He would exchange his salvation for, for theirs. That's how much his heart hurt and how much he loved these dear people. He couldn't do that, but it certainly speaks to the depth of pain that he was feeling. And if you have anybody, a loved one, a family member who has not yet believed in Christ, when you think about their eternal destiny, boy, it produces a knot in your stomach that just won't go away. And all Paul is emphasizing here is that not everyone will believe this. Salvation is a gift that can be rejected. And in, in, in uh, Israel's history, uh, Esau rejected his birthright with, with his brother Jacob. He said, I don't, want, I don't want to be a part of this family. I'll give up my, my birthright for a pot of stew in Genesis chapter 25. So people can say no to it. If you've accepted Christ, you're saved. And we can say, praise the Lord, I'm saved. But there's going to be some people who just say no to it. They have to express faith. And, and that same point is going to be made now here as Paul, as we learned secondly, that salvation is not equated with possessing spiritual blessings because God has blessed the Hebrew people. And Paul just started listing it. Verse 4. To them belongs the adoption as sons. He, he had picked the Jewish people out and then revealed himself. Verse 4, to them belongs the glory. That's a reference to that bright cloud that, that, that led the people and it hovered over the tabernacle and later filled the temple. It was a symbol of God's presence with the people. Verse 4, to them belong the covenants the binding agreements that, that God made with Abraham, and he made it with Moses, and he made it with David, and he made it with all the Jewish people the, called the New Covenant in Jeremiah 31, 31, that he would forgive their sins. They were blessed, immensely blessed, verse 4, with the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers or the patriarchs, from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all, God bless forever, amen. So in spite of their terrible suffering that the Hebrew people have suffered throughout history, they are like the most blessed people when it comes to the provision of God. But the point that Paul makes here is none of that matters apart from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the principle is clear. God blesses someone with privileges, doesn't guarantee that he's going to save that someone. Just remember, this is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Righteous. Everybody gets some of God's blessings, but not everyone receives the blessing of salvation. So, are you a true child of God? Then praise the Lord. There's no condemnation for you. 
God has forgiven you of all your sins. But some of those most abundantly blessed by God will say no to God's offer of salvation. And that was especially true of the Jewish nation as a whole. But did their unbelief mean that somehow God failed to deliver on his promise, his unconditional promise to Abraham to bless the nation? Well, Paul argues absolutely not. As a matter of fact, he makes that exact statement in verse 6, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. So the problem wasn't on God's side. The problem was on the nation of Israel's side as they failed to understand this third point that salvation is not guaranteed by family heritage. You see how Paul drives it home? Verse 6, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. The Jewish people mistakenly thought if they could trace their lineage back to Abraham, they would be automatically included in the God-given blessings promised to the patriarch. But God never intended it for it to work that way. Verse 7, but through Isaac, your descendants will be named. Well, we know from our Bibles that Abraham had eight sons, Ishmael by by Hagar, Isaac by Sarah, and then he had six sons with a a wife by the name of Keturah, whom he married after uh, Sarah died. But it was never part of God's plan to have all, all of Abraham's kids a part of his blessed spiritual family. And that's why Paul explains, verse 8, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. So the blessing upon Abraham to be a part of a spiritual family of forgiven people was going to come through Isaac. And thus, verse 9, for this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. So Paul is simply explaining that exclusion from God's favor doesn't negate his covenant promises given to Abraham because it never was intended to include all of Abraham's kids. And the whole point of this and the lesson that you and I and we learn is simply this. Salvation is based upon grace and not upon race. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. It doesn't matter your family heritage when it comes to salvation. It simply is based upon faith. And this is where the Hebrew people were so sadly mistaken. And we as Gentiles, from all our different ethnic backgrounds now, when we believe we are brought in to that spiritual family of Abraham. It's why in Romans 4, 11, Abraham is called the father of all who believe. So uh, this is an opportunity now. Celebrate your salvation. That's what we get to do here. And I would encourage all you parents, share with your kids your salvation story and ask your kids about their story. Because this is the thing that we hold to. Our greatest treasure is our salvation by faith. And not everybody will believe it, but I'm saved, you're saved. We say, praise the Lord. And Paul concludes this section. It's a gift that can be rejected. It's not based on on blessings, based on uh, on. Uh, on a gift of God. It's not based on race, but it's initiated by God's sovereign choice. And this is how verses 10 and following end up. And not only this, but there was Rebecca also when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. He's talking about Abraham's grandsons, these twin boys, Jacob and Esau, that were born to Isaac and Rebecca. Verse 11, For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. So before the twin boys had made any choices about sinning or not sinning, God had ignored the natural rights of the firstborn Esau and chose instead to give that blessing to Jacob. And why did he do it? Verse 11, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand. He did it that way because he wanted to. And that's the whole point of this. The principle, he chooses to save people because he chooses to save them. 
I don't fully understand it, but this is what the Bible teaches. And it's why Paul then quoted from, from the prophet Malachi, verse 13, just it is, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Don't, don't take that word hate as personal animosity. Uh, Esau had rejected his birthright. Uh, didn't mean in any way that Jacob was better, that Jacob was more deserving. Listen, Jacob was a horrible sinner. He was a liar. He was a deceiver. Uh, Esau was an immoral man. And, and the real question is not why in the world God would hate Esau. The question is why in the world would he ever love Jacob? Because Jacob certainly didn't deserve it. But the reason that he loved Jacob is because he chose to. And the crazy thing is uh, he did the same thing with you and me. You say, Pastor, that's not fair. I said, well, you come come tune in next week and I'll try and explain all of that very deep doctrine about the sovereignty of God in verses 14 through 29. Suffice to say, this is what the Bible teaches us. And he did it with you and with me and with all of us who are saved, Ephesians 1, 4. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. He picked you and you and you and you and me and those of us who believe, he just picked us to love us and to forgive us of all our sins. I don't know why he picked us, he just did. But this is where the Hebrew people went astray. Uh, they thought that if they were just good enough, God would accept them. And therefore they didn't need a savior because they thought they were doing just fine. Well, they came and they said no to Jesus. But you and I haven't done that. And, and that's wh where the apostle John in chapter one, that Jesus came to his own, referring to the Hebrew people, but his own received him not. So they said, no thank you to the offer of salvation and the fact that he was the Messiah. They said, no thank you, we don't believe it. But then John adds, but to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become, what's it say? Children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So if you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, you are saved. You are forgiven of your sins. Nothing can separate you from his love. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we can say, praise the Lord for that. That's the greatest gift in the midst of all the challenges we're facing right now. We can't lose that gift of our salvation. If you've not yet believed on the Lord Jesus, oh, I would encourage you to do so now. Uh, you need him. Uh, each one of us have sinned. Uh, we may be better than some, worse than others, but we're guilty as charged. And we need salvation and forgiveness. Well, the only way to get it is by believing in Christ. You can't work for it yourself. You'll never work hard enough. But Jesus offers it as a free gift to anyone who says, I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. Oh, if that's in your heart to do, won't you receive him as your savior? Invite him into your life and make him the cornerstone of your life. Jesus, I believe in you. Forgive me. I want to follow you. Oh, I hope you'll do it. The picture that we have of, of the forgiveness that is ours and what it cost Jesus to give us the gift is in communion. We remember his body and his blood, his, his death upon the cross that was given so that we might, might be forgiven completely. If you're a believer in Christ, now is the time to come and to say, Lord, uh, forgive me again. Lord, Lord, I want to have a close relationship with you. Now is the time to be honest. Uh, if you're not yet a believer, oh, use this time now. You're about to see it. Jesus gave himself fully for you. Believe on him and you'll be saved. I hope you will.